I want you to stand with me, if you would, as we get into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Word. Your Word is the truth, and we receive your Word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. Today, we're going to share with you on the subject of clothing yourself with the garments of God. Clothing yourself with the garments of God. Very important that we understand that you and I are to clothe ourselves. We see in Psalms 93, verse 1, The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. God would never have us do something that he wouldn't do himself. He has girded himself. He has clothed himself with strength and with majesty. God is a God who will never tell us to do something that he wouldn't do himself. Psalms 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, my, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. That's exactly what God wants us to clothe ourselves with as well. You know, Jesus was one who had to clothe himself. In Mark chapter 9, we even see the fact that when, in verse 2, it says, after six days, Jesus talked, taketh with him Peter and James and John, lead him up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And what happened? They saw in the spirit for a moment of what Jesus was like. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, white as snow, so no, as no fuller, the fuller on earth can whiten them. And we talked about the spiritual washing of the body of Christ in the past and the work of the fuller. If you weren't here, it's the fuller, which is really not the fuller, but really it means the fuller, is one who is cleansing the body of Christ and bringing it to the place of being white, stamping out all the impurities and getting rid of all of the filth. And this is, of course, Jesus was white as snow, as no fuller on earth can whiten them. He had clothed himself with the things of the Lord. We see over in Revelation, in chapter 1, speaking of Jesus, here in verse 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with the papples with a golden girdle. Jesus was clothed with a garment. And it's interesting, when you look at this particular word about being clothed with a garment, this is the word, and duo. You'll see this word many times today. And if you notice it below, and it means to sink into clothing or to put on like you're putting on clothing. And this particular word talking about him clothed with a garment, what it really is, it's in the perfect tense. The perfect tense shows completed action in the past, and it's in the middle voice. Remember what the middle voice is? The middle voice means the subject was doing the action for himself. That's important. See, that's why we've got to always look up the tense voice and mood, otherwise we miss out what's being said. So it literally says, having been clothed in the past for himself, he clothed himself with the garments of God, so that he was clothed with the things that God wanted. And then what happened? He was girt about, here as it says, with a golden girdle. Who gave him the golden girdle? Well, this says that it was passive voice, meaning somebody else did it. Who did it? God did it. That shows the fact that when you, when Jesus clothed himself with the things that God wanted, then God would give him something. And you're going to find that we're, when we get through tonight, today, you're going to see about the golden crown that's going to be upon those that clothe themselves. And that's what God wants for us to come to the place of arriving at. Over in Revelation 19, in verse 13, when Jesus is coming back, it speaks of him, how he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God, showing the fact that the blood of Jesus, having washed away all of our sins, and also the fact that this blood, showing the fact that that is the answer for the mankind. His name is called the Word of God. He's going to come back. He's going to make war. He's going to destroy the enemies in righteousness. Just as we see that Jesus clothed himself, you and I are also to clothe ourselves. What are we to clothe ourselves with? With his garments, the garments of God. 
and we are to put off all other garments that are not of God, and that is important. Well, how does our clothing begin? Well, the first thing that has to happen is we have to get born again. In Galatians chapter 3, over here in verse 27, it says this, For as many as you have, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now notice this, when it talks about being baptized into Christ, this is the Greek word baptizo, and this particular word is in the passive voice, meaning somebody else did it for us. We are baptized into Christ by the Lord. And when we come into Christ, that's the new birth. That's come into receiving the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, you must understand, if you've not heard me teach on this before, or if you've not read our book, The Difference Between Baptism, Receiving, Filling the Holy Spirit, you won't know this, because hardly anybody knows this out there in the entire body of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth, and we'll give you a scripture on it in the moment. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. The full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic world out there has taught that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation in error. It is wrong, and it has caused great confusion in the body of Christ because of the fact that all the fundamentalist believers say, I've already been baptized with the Holy Spirit when I got born again and I'll give you a scripture on it in a moment. But I want you to see that this is the baptism into Christ is passive, it is done by the Lord, and this is when we get born again. Again, we'll give a scripture in a moment. And what's the result of that? You have put on Christ. And here, put on Christ is in the middle voice, which means the person put on for himself Christ. Now, could we put on for ourselves Christ ourselves without God doing something? No. But what is our aspect of putting on Christ? You have a part to play, which means you're doing something for yourself. It's when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, what happens? We have a part to play. We have to do it for ourselves, receiving him, and he comes to dwell on the inside of us. And now we are clothed with a new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, I mentioned to you, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. This is the scripture that clearly shows that it is that. And any fundamentalist believer will tell you this if they know their Bible, which most of them do on this subject. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, <clears throat> For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What's the body of Christ? That's what we come into when we're born again, right? So you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into one body. Just briefly, the word baptized is an untranslated Greek word, baptizo, which means to immerse or submerge or dip in something. And the word shows the fact that something that we are dipped into has an effect upon us to bring us into the body of Christ. Now, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit, immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. What happens when you receive Jesus, your personal Lord and Savior? You get born again. And how does that happen? The Holy Spirit engulfs you, and he takes the old spirit out and puts a brand new spirit in, which is what? The spirit of Jesus Christ. Because you come into one body. That is important to understand. Because if I have a pail of water, you can even understand it. Let's say I have a pail of water here. I take my hand, I stick it down in the water. My hand is effectively baptized in the water, isn't it? Immersed, submerged in the water. Or same thing in this analysis, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that means that the water could have an effect upon me because it's, I'm immersed in its presence. But does the water get into me? No, the water doesn't get into me. But if I took the same water and drank the water, it would get into me, wouldn't it? The second part of the verse tells you how the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. We have all been made to drink into one spirit. Notice the phrases, into one body and into one spirit. The body is the body of Christ when you get born again. The one spirit is the Holy Spirit that you receive once you have been born again, coming to dwell on the inside of you. And drinking is synonymous with receiving the Holy Spirit, as we see in John chapter 7, over in verse 37, where he said at the last day of the feast, he stood and he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. What's drinking? I drink something, it gets into me, doesn't it? And what's he talking about? Verse 39 says, this spake he of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, 
which they that believe on him, those are people who are born again, that believe on him, should receive, which is the Greek word lambano. The correct term for the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us is receiving the Holy Spirit. First, we get born again, and we receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the immersing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The old Spirit's taken out, the new Spirit comes into us. It's done by God, and because we received Jesus, what have we done? We've put on Christ for our own benefit, clothing ourselves with now a new Spirit, and then the receiving of the Holy Spirit, so we come into one Spirit, is received subsequent to salvation. And it's scripturally called receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, in first, second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 6. If you have any questions on that, you can be glad to answer them later. It is contrary to what's been taught, but there's so much that's been taught out there that it's error. Yeah, we need to know the truth. Second Chronicles 6.41. Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place. Where is his resting place? Us. He's not in the temples made with hands any longer. Where does God now come to dwell? In us. We are the temple of God. He's going to rise into his resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. What happens when we get born again? We are now clothed with salvation. We have a brand new spirit. We are in relationship with God. Our spirit is right with him. We are come into salvation in the Lord. Now, at the same time as we begin to see the things we need to put on, we also are going to be talking about things we need to put off. Because many people just try to put things on, but they never put off the things that they have to get rid of. And the, the wonder they have problems. We see a scripture in Zechariah chapter 3, over in verse 3, where it says this. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. He had filthy garments. That's not God's garments. And he stood before the angel. And in verse 4, he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. The filthy garments have to be taken away from you and from me, which is all the things of sin, all the things of the flesh, all the evil spirits, they all have to be cast out, everything that is filthy. He said unto him, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. How does the iniquity pass? When we deal with the sin and the works of the flesh and the evil spirits. Remember, the iniquity is the result of sin, which is of our heart. And what is the iniquity brought? It's brought curses upon us, three and four generations, through the evil spirits that come into us. So to deal with the iniquity, which is the effect of sin, we have to not only confess our sins, repent and turn away from them and crucify the flesh, but we also need to cast out the evil spirits that have come in from the sin to get free of all the effects of the iniquities, which is what brought curses upon us. So we deal with sin in the flesh and we cast out the demons. The iniquity is going to pass from us. And he says, I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. One of the things that we see is once you've come to Jesus Christ, you have a brand new spirit on the inside of you. But now God wants to do an absolute change and transformation in your life. He is going to change you in every way in your life. In Genesis chapter 35, we see what he says in verse... One, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. What does Bethel mean? Bethel means house of God. Get to the place where you're hearing the word of God. Get to church, get to in, hear the word of God, and dwell there. We should be dwelling in coming to church and hearing the word of God, dwelling in the presence of God. Make there an altar unto God. What do you do with an altar? You worship God at the altar. So he wants you to come, and he wants you to begin to praise and worship God. And he goes on in verse 2, and he says, Then Jacob said to his household and all that were with him, this is God's instructions, come and worship him and dwell there. Put away the strange gods that are among you. We do have to get rid of all the strange gods. God's not going to have any other gods come before him. You've got to get rid of everything that is not of the Lord, anything that's a source other than the Lord. And be clean. He wants you to be cleansed, to be pure. So we've got to go through the cleansing process and change your garments. We're getting rid of all the filthy garments. We're getting all, rid of all the garments of the world and of the flesh and of sin and all the evil things. And we're going to put on the garments of God. It is important that we get rid of all, the, rid of all these strange garments. There's even a scripture over in Zephaniah 1, 
in verse 8 that says this, It shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I'll punish the princes and the king's children. That would be believers, wouldn't it? The king's children, who's the king type of? Jesus is the king. Who's the children? The ones that are born again. And all such as are clothed with strange apparel. You can't be clothed with any of the strange that's foreign apparel. Remember, you are now born from above. You're, you're not of this world. You're from above. And you are a brand new creation. You are a, a part of the church of the firstborn. And you are to be clothed with God's garments, not with any strange apparel. If you have the strange apparel on, you're going to be punished, it says. And that's speaking to the king's children. That's why it's imperative that we get ourselves rid of all the evil garments. We see a scripture over in Numbers, in chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8, over here in verse 6. He said, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. The Levites were the priests. Well, who's the priest today? You and I are. We're all priests of God. And what does God want? He wants us to be cleansed. You've got to be cleansed. Now, how'd they do this? Thus shalt thou do unto them, to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them. What's the water? It's the washing of the water of the word, as it talks about in Ephesians 5. We've got to get the word in us. You're going to be cleansed through the word of God working in your life. Let them shave all their flesh. That means all the things of the flesh have to be cut off, don't they? That's all the fleshly works. That's why we've got to crucify the flesh daily. And let them wash their clothes. Everything needs to be washed. And this is the word which refers to the wash, washing done by the fooler who's going to tread all the impurities underfoot and get rid of everything so you are white as snow. And that's what God wants. And so make themselves clean. So through the word of God and through crucifying the flesh, and seeing God bring forth the washing, the purging, the cleansing in your life of all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, getting rid of all the evil spirits, you're going to make, it says, so make themselves clean, which means whose responsibility is it? It's our responsibility, isn't it, to do these things. Over in Exodus, we see in chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go into the people, Moses is a type of Christ. He comes unto us. And he said, sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's two days, isn't it? That's the two days from the time of Jesus Christ. It's prophetic of the 2,000 years, the time of Christ up until now. And let them wash their clothes. Again, wash by treading this under. The fooler would just stamp out all the impurities and get rid of every bit of it. So what is the church supposed to be doing during the church age? They're supposed to be getting washed in order to be sanctified, holy, consecrated under the Lord. That's why we've got to go through the cleansing process. Over in 2 Samuel, chapter 12. 2 Samuel, chapter 12, we see over here in verse 20. David arose from the earth and washed, and he anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord. We've got to be washed. The anointing is going to come how? through the Word of God, which is anointed, through the whole working of the Holy Spirit in our life, and through praising and worshiping God, where we bring a filling of the Spirit of God into us. And as we're following the Lord, seeking Him, His anointing is going to be manifest in us. And change is apparel again. Notice we have to be changed. And come into the house of the Lord and worship. And then He came to His own house when He required, set bread before Him, and He did eat. That's what we're going to do. We're going to come and we're going to worship, and we're going to eat before the Lord. We're going to eat all the things that he has. You eat something, it's going to come into you. It's going to be digested. It's going to become a part of you. And that's what you are doing with the word of God and all the things that he is bringing unto you. Praise God. In Exodus chapter 28, Exodus chapter 28, verse 2. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Holy garments. The holy garments were so that they'd be sanctified <coughs> and consecrated. Here he says that thou shalt speak unto all them that are wise-hearted, whom I filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. What's that show you? As you get consecrated, as you are one who has the holy garments on, you are going to be able to minister unto him in the priest's office, which you and I are a priest before God. Now, he's the high priest, say, well, that was just for the high priest. Well, 
It's also for all the sons. And what he did, he put all these garments on with a breastplate and the ephod, the robe, and all these different things that he would put on him. And this is all pointing over to the fact that you and I are to put on all the garments of God, which, of course, is going to be shown forth through the Word of God, including the armor of God, which we'll see shortly, that are important for you in order to be clothed with God's garments. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 29, he says this, The holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. Otherwise, it wasn't just for Aaron the high priest, it was also for his sons, all the priests, which means it's for us. And notice again, that as the holy garments are put on, it's it to be anointed therein. This means that in the measure that you have put on the garments of God will be the measure that the anointing of God will be working in your life. That was the purpose. And to be consecrated in them. Now it's important that we understand that if you don't put on the garments of God, you're never going to see God be able to accomplish His purpose in your life. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 1, he says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O Zion, Zion is the church. You and I are from Mount Zion, talking about the true church that's born from above. Put on thy beautiful garments. You see, the garments of God are beautiful garments to him. The word in you is beautiful to him. Holy garments are beautiful to God. And you're going to put on strength as you're putting on all, <clears throat> all the beautiful garments of God. He says, for henceforth, there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. That means no more are we going to let any unclean things. No more is anything that is not holy before God is going to come into us because you and I are going to be sure that we don't let it come into us. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And also he says, well, you've been in captivity. Now you're to loose yourself and come out of this. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And how do we do it in the New Testament? We take dominion over the devils. We cast them out. We destroy their works. We speak to every mountain to be removed. We come forth and we possess everything that God has for us. And we see the enemy be put underfoot in our life. Another thing that's important, if you're going to put on the garments of God, we see over in Isaiah in chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, that is. Verse 3, he says this. To anoint them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Otherwise, you're to put on garments of praise. Get rid of that heaviness. If you become a praiser and a worshiper of God, you'll be filled with the spirit. You'll have the joy of the Lord. And that spirit of heaviness will come off of you. By the way, when it talks about the garment of praise, we haven't done a, a teaching on praise and worship, but it'll be coming very shortly. We'll be doing a teaching on praise and worship coming up. But the garment of praise, the word praise, is tehillah. There's seven Hebrew words for praise. And this particular word, tehillah, means to essentially sing your, the halal, sing the praise, sing the, it's from ta and hila which is the word, main word for praise. So it's to sing your praise, and it's talking about a spontaneous praise and worship coming forth out of you. Not just singing the songs, which are all good songs in line with the Scripture, but God wants you to have a spontaneous praise coming forth out of your heart. That is a praise, as you will see when we study Tehillah, that God manifests Himself. That's also the praise of when you sing a new song, it's the word Tehillah unto the Lord. And God's presence manifests mightily. He wants you to learn not just to sing songs you know, but sing praise and worship coming out of your heart unto the Lord. And it's going to lift off that spirit of heaviness, but it's going to bring the mighty presence of the Lord into manifestation. We also see in verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. What are we putting on? The garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom de decked himself with ornaments and a bride adorned herself with her jewels. You and I are to get the garments of salvation on, plural, which are all the things God wants, and it's, you're going to be clothed with, as it says, covered with the robe of righteousness. In fact, righteousness is something that you put on. 
Remember, we saw when we talked about righteousness that you become righteous as you meet the conditions of doing the things that are necessary. In Job 9, 29, 14, he says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. As you put on righteousness, it's going to clothe you. And that is important because you've got to be righteous to be right before God. When you're righteous, the enemy's not going to be able to get to you. When there's unrighteousness because of sin, then the door's open and the enemy will be able to come in and bring destruction in your life. So we're going to put on righteousness. We see the same thing brought forth here in Psalms 132, over here in verse 9, where he says, Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. God wants you clothed. And how are you going to do that? With the word of righteousness. As you get the word of righteousness in you, and you do the word of righteousness, in the measure you have done that is the measure that you've been clothed with righteousness. Down in verse 16, he says, I'll also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy with the salvation of the Lord. And salvation is more than just talking about getting born again. It talks about deliverance. It talks about being safe, being prosperous, being blessed, having welfare, having victory. It's talking about God's work in your life that when you clo are clothed with the salvation of the Lord, it's going to bring forth all the promises of God and the victory that will come forth in your life. Now, at the same time, we see something that speaks about what the women are to clothe themselves with in their homes. In Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 25, talking about the virtuous woman in this chapter, strength and honor are her clothing. Women, God wants you to put on strength and put on honor. You are to have strength and honor, not weakness, not sadness, not depression, not negativism, not harping, complaining, or whatever all. You're to have strength, and you're to have honor put on you as clothing for your, as you are at work to see that your household is being ministered unto. Praise God. That's important for all women. Also, we see things that we must put on and put off when we are entering into battle. Remember when David was going to come against Goliath? And we see that Saul was going to give him his armor. You have to understand that Saul is a man after the flesh, is what it's a type of, while David is a man after the spirit. Well, in verse 38, Saul armed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of brass upon his head. He armed him with a coat of mail. He girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. Otherwise, I can't have these pieces of armor on. That's the armor of the flesh. You're never going to get the victory if you try to deal with things in the flesh. The armor of the flesh won't do it. You've got to put on God's armor, which is spiritual armor, which is being clothed with God's garments. And that's exactly what he did. He says, he put them off. He put off all these things of the flesh because they weren't going to give him victory over his enemy. He had to get the things of God. And that's what you've got to do. Get rid of all the things of the flesh. Don't try to deal with your problems in the flesh. Instead, you deal with them after the Spirit, according to the Word of God, with spiritual weapons to triumph over your enemies. We also see in Isaiah chapter 59, in verse 16, here's where he was looking for a man. He was looking for an intercessor. His arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness has sustained him, and that's speaking about Jesus. But we also see it says what he did. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Gee, that's what he put on. The intercessor puts on. A helmet of salvation upon his head. Sounds like parts of the armor of God, doesn't it? And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. The garments of vengeance. You must put on the garments of vengeance because you are going to rise in war. We're going to war a good warfare. We're going to fight a good fight of faith. We are going to enter into battle and destroy the enemies. And it says he was clad with zeal as a cloak. That's why the zeal of God has to consume you as we sing that song. Put the garments of vengeance on. Put on zeal. Put on righteousness as a breastplate. Put on the helmet of salvation upon his head. What are you going to do? According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he'll pay a recompense. Otherwise, you're going to engage in the warfare, and God's going to use you to destroy his enemies. It's called payback time to the devils, and they're going to be cast out, and their works are going to be destroyed in your life. Now, if we don't get clothed with the things of God, and we don't have clothes on, we essentially will be naked before the Lord. We don't want to be found naked. In Luke chapter 8, 
We see this man from Gadara. Remember the man who had all the evil spirits within him? How did he get so bad? He obviously was walking in ways of sin, and the enemy came in. And it's interesting that it says in Luke 8, verse 27, when speaking of Jesus, when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time. Now, these devils were running him for a long time. And wore no clothes. That'd be something natural, but you know what? The natural reflects that which is of the spirit. He didn't have any spiritual clothes on. He didn't have any protection. He didn't have any of God's garments on that would protect him. Instead, he was naked. He was unclothed. And the demons were just running this guy. Neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Well, what happened after the demons were cast out of him? Look what it says in verse 35. Then when they went out to see what was done, came to Jesus, found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Now, what, was the first, what happened? The demons were cast out. What's the second thing? He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. What does that remind you of? Remember Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and heard his word? What happens? You need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word so you get his word in you, which is so you're going to be clothed. And what was the result? It said he was clothed. Because this word sitting here, we talk about this word. This doesn't mean he was just sitting there for a moment. You have to understand it's a spiritual revelation. It's present tense, continuous, repeated action, meaning this guy was ongoing sitting at the feet of Jesus. It is a spiritual revelation of the fact that you and I must get ourselves sitting at the feet of Jesus and get the Word of God in us. And then when it talks about the fact that he was clothed here, we see this. It shows the fact that it was perfect tense, which shows you the result of you continually sitting at the feet of Jesus. You're going to be clothed. That's past tense, already accomplished. This is a spiritual revelation. As you get the Word in you, the result will be you will having been clothed. And notice who's doing it. God's doing it through his word. That's why it's passive voice. Somebody else is doing the work. God is doing the work as you sit at the feet of Jesus. So you have a part to play. See, you can't clothe yourself. God's, you have a part to play in clothing yourself and acting on the word, but it's actually God who's doing the clothing. And what was the result? He was in his right mind. He's in his right mind, not just because the demons are cast out, you can get the demons cast out and you can continue to walk in sin or walk in the flesh and you're going to let the demons come back in and you aren't certainly walking in the ways of the Lord. Well, how are you going to come to the place of having a right mind before God? Because you're going to get your mind transformed by the renewing of it. And you're going to get your mind to the place where you have a spiritual mind, not a fleshly mind, and you're going to have a mind that produces life and peace in you. So you have to understand, this is a factual statement, but this is also a revelation of spiritual things that happen in a person's life. As the demons are cast out and you get yourself filled up with the Word of God, He will clothe you and you will come to the place of being in your right mind so you'll close the door. And you're not going to let the devils come into you anymore. In Luke chapter 10, down here in verse 39, this is where we see about Mary. He had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard His Word. That's what we need to do. You've got to be in the Word every day. As you're in the Word every day, you're clothing yourself. You're clothing yourself. And God's actually doing it through the Word coming into you. It's being written in your heart, and it's being written in your mind. Now, as we mentioned, there's things that we have to put off. And we see over in Hebrews, in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, over here in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. The word lay aside means to put off. Put off every weight, whatever would pull you down, and the sin that does so easily beset us, the sin that's been so easily tripping you up, God wants you to put it off. You have dominion. Sin has no dominion over you. And what are you going to do at the same time? You're not going to do nothing. You're going to run with patience the race. What's the race? That's the contest that you're involved in. Because this particular word, when it talks about race, it's number 73, which comes from 70, uh, form of 71. It's also a part of number 75, which is the word for fighting the good fight of faith. And this is talking about the fight, or the conflict, or the battle, or the contest, is what this is referring to. We are running with steadfastness 
the, the battle, the contest against the enemy that's set before us. You have to understand that the race is talking about a spiritual race against spiritual enemies that you are going to have to triumph over. This is why you've got to lay aside the weight and the sin that so, so easily besets you and get yourself running that race, that contest, in order to see the prize come to pass in your life. So we've got to get rid of, deal with all these things in our life. Also in James chapter 1, we see over here in verse 21, it says, lay apart, same word, put off all filthiness, everything that defiles you. That's why we've got to deal with, again, all the sin, the works of the flesh, anything in the world, all the evil spirits, all defilement has to be eliminated. And the superfluity, which means the abundance of naughtiness, which means that which is wicked or evil, all, all the, the, the abundance of wickedness, everything that is filthy, everything that is of wickedness that has come into your life has to be put off. And then you receive, accept, this is the word decamai, which means to accept with meekness, a teachable lowliness, humility of mind, the engrafted, which means implanted word, words of being planted in, in your heart and in your mind, which is able to save your souls. Does it automatically save your soul? No, unless you do something with it. That's why the next verse goes on and says, but become, this word be, be actually means become, it's not the word for be, it's not a to be verb, it means become, ginamai, doers of the word. And when you become doers of the word, that's because you're going to be doing it consistently. See, you don't become a doer of the word overnight. It's by hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing. Present tense. Become continuously doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So it's very important that we, again, we put off the evil. We put off all the filthiness. We put off all these things. We get the word in us, and we be a doer of it. So then we will see the blessings come forth in our life. Verse 25 says, when you look into the perfect law of liberty, that's what God's word will. It's a perfect law of liberty. It'll bring freedom to you, liberty and freedom and victory, and continue therein. Otherwise, you just didn't look into it once. It became your lifestyle. He, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed. You're going to see God's blessings come on you and overtake you in your life. Over in 1 Peter, we see something else that says that we're to put off. 1 Peter 2, 1. Wherefore, laying aside, same word, put off, all malice, all guile, which is any deceit, all hypocrisies. We've got to get rid of all hypocrisies. We can't be saying that we're one way and then doing another. Envyings and all evil speakings. Put off all these things. But are, isn't there something we're supposed to do? Yeah. And as newborn babes desire or long for, pursue after, the, with sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. We've got to get the word of God. The pure, unmixed, the sincere means unmixed, unadulterated. That means we can't have any compromise. We've got to be sure we're getting the exact word of God. The milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And as you start to do the word, do the word of righteousness, you're going to grow up and you're going to get strong in the things of the Lord. So again, this speaks of the fact that we got to lay aside the evil and then get the word in us, which is going to produce what God wants in your life. And you're going to be putting on the th garments of God. In Jude, chapter 23, we see something else. It says, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You got to realize all fleshly works means you got spots. The word spot means to def be defiled. We can't have any things of the flesh on us. You're defiled. You've got all these spots on you, spiritual spots, so to speak. No, we're supposed to be white, clean, pure, holy before the Lord. God wants all the spots eliminated. That's why we've got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and allow God to work and to bring forth what he purposes as we cast out all the spirits. Now, how about to the guy who's a backslider? Well, God was calling him back to him. In Luke chapter 15, in verse 22, the person who's backslid or turned away in any area of the word of God, here's the prodigal son when he came back to the father. The father said to his servants in Luke 20, 15, 22, bring forth the best robe. Now, the word best is a mistake. It actually means first. Notice it's the word protos. Should have been translated first. Look at this. 105 times 
85 times translated first, nine chief, two of them first, <clears throat> one time it's only been translated this best. It kind of throws you. It means the first robe. What was the first robe we got? The robe of righteousness. Bringing you back to righteousness. Meaning when you repent and you confess your sins and you come back from walking in the wrong way as a prodigal, God will restore you to righteousness. You will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and you will now have the robe of righteousness on. And so don't let the past sins beat you down. Well, you've confessed your sins. God does not remember your sins or iniquities anymore, praise God. At the same time, that doesn't mean we still have to, we still have to cast out the demons that have come in from it, but you are in right fellowship with the Lord and you're right before him when you've confessed your sins. And he was to put it on him, again, and duo, sink into clothing, clothing, being clothed by this. And by the way, this particular word, when it talks about clothing him, this is God, the Father, actively doing this, and it was a command. He was actively putting on this robe, which is the robe of righteousness. Otherwise, it'll be put back on. God will put it back on. It might have been off, but God will put it back on if the person comes and repents. Now, we see something else about putting on the garments of God over in Luke chapter 24, down here in verse 49. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. What was that? The Holy Spirit. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Why'd they have to wait there? Because that's where the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out on the day of Pentecost. Until you be endued with power from on high. Now, people have missed this because they haven't looked up the words. They thought that because the Holy Spirit came, I automatically have the power of God. Well, if the Holy Spirit in you means you automatically have the power of God, why aren't we flowing in the power of God? You've got to understand what is being said. The word endued is this word enduo, which again means to be sinking into clothing or clothe yourself. And this particular word is in the middle voice. The middle voice meaning that the subject does the action for himself. Therefore, until you clothe yourself, is what it literally says, with power, that's the word dunamis. Oh, by the way, this, if you notice that word for enduo, it was not automatic, was it? How do you know? Because it said it was in the subjunctive. Let's get that verb back up here. Notice it's a subjunctive mood. That means it's conditional. The subjunctive mood means conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, until you clothe yourself with power, if you meet the conditions, you've got to do what he says in order to see the power of God be put on you from on high. This brings us to a point of, again, people have misunderstood these verses. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look what it says. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Many people say, oh, wait a minute. You just said that we're supposed to clothe ourselves with power, and it hadn't come on us just because the Holy Spirit came. This one looks like after the Holy Spirit's come, we've already ha received power. Well, first of all, we've got to understand that the word receive is the word lambano, which means take hold of. It is in the future tense, which means that you shall, that's after something, isn't it? Future follows something that's already been spoken of. You shall, in the future, take hold of power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, or the Holy Ghost having come upon you, which came first. Now you're supposed to take hold of power. How can you take hold of power? Because the Holy Spirit in you is going to enable you to take hold of power as you put on the whole armor of God and you do all the things that God says, the Holy Spirit's going to enable you to be full of the power of God. In other words, it didn't happen when the Holy Spirit came into you. It happens after the Holy Spirit by you taking hold of, lambano, the power of God. Well, how are we going to take hold of the power of God? You know, that means, hey, I've got some responsibility here to get clothed with the power of God. That's part of God's garments. Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 tells us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. The word strong is en dunamo, you see in the lower window. Dunamis means power, en means in, empowered within. This particular word is present tense, continuous action. You're supposed to be continually be empowered. Passively, meaning somebody else is going to do it, God's going to do it. In the Lord, 
Also, it's an imperative, meaning it's a command. Well, if it's a command that's supposed to happen, but God's going to do it, that means the things that you do must allow God to do it. And you'll see that. The things you do allows God to bring this empowering in your life. It's not automatic. And in the power, this word is kratos, which means a manifested power. It's different from dunamis. Power, when we studied this, or if you haven't read the book on the Power and Might book, you ought to read it. This is the word kratos, which means a manifestation of a, a release of the power of his might or mighty force. So this is saying that you and I are commanded to be inwardly, continually empowered, God's doing it, in the Lord and with a manifest power of his mighty force. How is that going to happen? Do we have a part to play? Yes, because it's a command for us. So we must have some part to play in seeing God do this. That's right. Put on the whole armor of God. We put on, see the word put on? What does it tell us? It is a command going right along with the command of what we're to do to have, be empowered, full, have the power of God with us, in us. And it says middle voice, which means the subject is doing the action for himself. This is where you and I have our part to play. In other words, to be inwardly empowered by God, you are going to have to put on for yourself, which is the middle voice, your responsibility to do it, the whole armor of God. So as I put on the whole armor of God, I'm going to have the power of God resonant within me. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, it's against all these evil spirits that we're work against. This, so he says, therefore take unto you, it's your responsibility to take it up, the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and that's the day the devil shows up. And having done all, doing everything he says of putting on the whole armor, you're going to be able to stand victorious. So he says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, that's the word, and having on, this word having on is the word enduo. In fact, if we go back here for this, the word about having your loins girt about, it is a word which is a little different word, if you notice below, but it means to fasten garments with a girdle. Otherwise, all these garments that you're putting on are going to be fastened with the word of God. That's how you're putting everything on. Having on, sinking into clothing and duo. And again, when it talks about us putting on these things, again, it's the middle voice showing that it's our responsibility to put it on for ourselves. The breastplate of righteousness. How? By hearing and doing the word of righteousness. What's the breastplate cover? Your heart. And then, talks about the word in your heart, isn't it? And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet, so they're going to be directed with the word of God. The preparation is a preparedness and a readiness that you bring forth through the word in you. It's going to be an internal preparation through the word in you, so you're ready to always do what the word says, instead of thinking, what should I do in this situation? If you are internally prepared with the word, it's going to direct your steps that you walk in. Your feet will take step by step. Above all, taking, you take hold of, take up the shield of faith, which where, where you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And what's that with? Again, with the word of God. Everything's with the word. What do you, how do you quench the fiery dart of the wicked? You speak. It is written. It is written. It is written to quench those fiery darts. And take, now this is a different word, not lambano. It's the word decamai, which means accept or have a ready reception for the helmet of salvation. What's the helmet cover? Your head. What's that speak of? The word coming into your mind. You've got to be ready to accept the word that's coming into your mind of salvation. That's why you've got to be teachable and receptive. <coughs> you can't be resistant to what God wants to bring to you through the word. And then also, then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is that which is spoken. You get, get hold of your sword and you begin to speak forth the word to smite the enemies. That's what you war with, with your sword. And what do you do with the armor of God on? The word in your heart, the word in your mind, the word sp spoken to deal with all the enemies, the word that's going to smite the enemies as you're smiting them with the sword of the Spirit. And you're going to pray because of the power of God resident within you with all prayer and supplication, which is going to release the manifestation of the power of God with mighty force out of you as you pray. 
So you've got to understand, do we pray to put on the armor of God every morning? No. A lot of people teach that. Get up in the morning, pray, and put on the armor of God. Prayer does not put the armor of God on. The Word puts the armor of God on. And what do you do with the armor of God on? You pray with it on. What does prayer do? It releases that which you have on for the power of God to be released out of you with all manner of prayer. So therefore, you get the Word in you, the armor's on, then you pray to release the power of God out of you. Praise God. Over in Romans, we see further about it's talking about several places in the New Testament about this armor. In Romans chapter 13, verse 12, it says, The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. There are things, again, we have to cast off. We're going to put off, same word, putting off, the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Again, what's the light, armor of light? It's the word of God. Middle voice, meaning our responsibility to do it. Subjunctive mood, meaning it's conditional, depending upon whether or not you do it or not. I mean, the armor of light is not automatically on you just because you're born again. It's conditional upon you doing it. And then down in verse 14, he says, and puts you on, same word, and duo. And this particular word, again, is in the middle voice. And this is an imperative verb. That means it's a command. That means it's not a suggestion. I'll try my best. No, God has commanded us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You mean I'm putting Jesus on me, clothing myself with Jesus? That's right. You're to be, how are you going to become like him? Because you put him on. And you're putting him on through the word of God. And make no provision or forethought, that means, for the flesh. You're not even going to think about going the way of the flesh. You're only going to go the way of the spirit. If you go the way of the flesh, you'll end up fulfilling the lust thereof. We see also over in Ephesians chapter 4, things that we're to put off and put on. Ephesians 4, verse 22, look what it says. That you put off, same word that we've seen time and time again, concerning the former conversation, the old man. Conversation means manner of life or conduct. All the conduct and manner of life of the old man, the man of the flesh, before you got born again, you're to put it off. You're not supposed to carry it around with you and be one minute in the flesh and one minute in the spirit. No, God wants you to get rid of all that, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Being renewed in your mind means you're going to have a spiritual mind in the ways of the spirit. And that you put on, again, the word and duo, and whose responsibility is it? Same thing, middle voice. How do I, I said, I thought I was a new man when I got born again. You were in spirit but you haven't put on the new man yet. That's only put on through the word of God, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you're to put on the new man coming on the inside of you through the word of God being renewed. We see a scripture over in Colossians chapter 3. Again, talking about the same very thing. Verse 8, it tells us things we put off. Now put off all these, anger. Get rid of that anger. Put it off. God doesn't want you to have anger, wrath, malice, any ill will, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. We can't be carrying on these kind of ways in our life. That's why the world looks at Christians and say, you're just like me, you, got the same, you do the, act the same way. That shouldn't be happening. We should be absolutely different from the ways of the world. They should see the, the Lord Jesus Christ in us and coming out of us in everything that we do. And have put on the new man. Again, this shows the fact that who's supposed to do this? When it talks about in duo, as we've been looking at this word continuously, and whose responsibility is it? Ours, middle voice. You put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. That means in the measure that you've got the renewal of your mind to the knowledge of God and you're walking in it and doing it, is the measure that you've put on the new man in your life. If you haven't got the word in you too much, you're probably walking according to the flesh a lot, and you have not put on the new man. When it talks about renewed in knowledge, by the way, the word knowledge, I want you to notice, I put the cursor over the word knowledge. It's not just trying to get some knowledge out there. No, it's precise, correct, accurate knowledge of the word of God. That's why we study. 
God wants you to know exactly what the Word says. Not just to have some knowledge and think that you know what it is. He wants, to know, he wants you to know the Word. You're going to get precise, correct, accurate knowledge of the Word of God. Then we see over here in verse 12, it tells us other things we put on. You're to put on, again, in duo, whose responsibility is it? Yours and mine, middle voice. Is it a suggestion? No. It's a command. God's commanded you to do this. As the elect, or like, this means like the elect of God, the chosen of God, because the chosen of God have done this. The ones that won't do this, they're going to be one of the ones that are called but not chosen. Remember, many are called and few are chosen. We're not going to be chosen if we don't put on the things he says. Clothing ourselves with the garments of God. Holy and beloved, which is what you're to be, the elect of God. Bowels of mercies, we put on mercy. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Forbearing, it means holding up one another. We don't tear people down. Don't ever tear anybody down. Build them up, hold them up. Forgiving one another. Always forgive. Don't hold anything against anybody. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ also forgave you, so do you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, which is agape love. God wants you to have love, showing love to everybody, realizing everybody is valuable, precious, and of great worth. You're never going to do any evil to them. It is the bond of perfectness. See, God says we're to go on to perfection. And you'll never go on to perfection unless you get established in love in your life. But that's where God's taking us all to. What else are we to put on? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on, and duo, same word, middle voice, our responsibility, the breastplate of faith and of love. That means Right, if you are one of those that, well, I need to pray for more faith. It's not scriptural to pray for faith. It's scriptural for you to put on faith. How? By hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. A lot of people say, well, I want you to pray for my faith. Pray for my faith to get strong. It's a wasted prayer. It's not going to go anywhere. I'll pray for you to get in the word of God, start hearing the word of God, and start doing the word of God so that the unfaith will come and you'll start acting on it and your faith will grow because you do the word. And love, you put on love. And for a helmet, remember that's covering your mind, the hope or confident expectancy of the salvation. That's your mind being renewed so you have a confident expectancy of what God will do every time. Hope is of the soul. Breastplate covers the heart. So faith and love are of the heart, while hope is of the soul because of the word in your mind. And these are things you're to put on. Because remember, what's the word say? It says that this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, that I'll take my word and he's going to put it and write it in our heart and in our mind. See, the word is being put. So that's why you've got to have the word inscribed in your heart. You've got to guard your heart so the devil doesn't take it out. And also in your mind. Keep it in your mind and guard your mind and heart so you don't let any evil things come in as well because the devil's always trying to get the word out of you. Another thing that we're to clothe ourselves with, 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 5, look what he says. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility. This is a little bit different word where it's talking about like fasting or girding yourself together with humility. God wants us to be humble before the Lord. That is an imperative. And of course, what's that mean? We're going to have to do. We're going to have to put off pride. You've got to put off pride or you're never going to be clothed with the garments of God. We've got to get rid of those things. Now, over in Matthew 22, we see something important. In Matthew chapter 22, we see if we, in, there's a parable that Jesus brought to him. And in verse 11, he made a statement here. He says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now, you miss this in the King James because... They didn't translate things quite right. Because I put the cursor over had, not on, and what do we see? It's the word and duo, which has been translated put on or clothed throughout. Why they didn't translate it correctly, it, you lose the whole thing here. There was a man which had not put on a wedding garment. And notice, middle voice, meaning he's responsible to do it. 
Who's this talking about? Talking about us. So this means we are those that should have put on the wedding garment. Not talking about being born again. It's talking about the born again Christian doing something to be sure they have a wedding garment on. And that is important. Well, he didn't put on the garment. Should have put it on. Showing the fact perfect tense, meaning it should have already been accomplished. Having put on, already done it. If we haven't done it, we're going to be in trouble, see? He says, friend, how came us then not having on or having a, a wedding garment? He was speechless. And what they do with him? They took him away and cast him into outer darkness. That's quite a statement. We've got to be sure we put on the wedding garment, the garment of God. Well, how are we going to do this? In fact, for a moment, we're going to see what the next verse is telling the fact that who puts on the garment? The ones who are the chosen ones. Because the next verse says, many are called but few are chosen. Why were these guys sent to the outer darkness and were this weeping and gnashing of teeth? They were one of the called, but they weren't one of the chosen. Why? Because they didn't do what God said. They didn't put on the wedding garment. Well, what do we see over in Revelation chapter 19? In verse 7, it tells us something important here. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. This is talking about the marriage of, for uh, the bride of Christ, us, the body of Christ, the bride, with Jesus, who's the bridegroom. And his wife, it shouldn't be wife, because if you haven't been married yet, she's not your wife yet. You're married after, you're, she's your wife after you're married. It really should mean a betrothed woman, an engaged woman, because the gune is a word which is translated wife, but it's also translated woman throughout the scripture. You've got to look at the context to be what, see what's being said. It literally means an engaged woman, a betrothed woman. Hath made herself ready. Well, let's see about this one. When it talks about she has prepared herself, hath made herself, let's get up there and catch this. <clears throat> she has made herself ready. Maybe here, there's, I thought there was a verb here somewhere it should be. Yeah, here it is. Otherwise, she actively did something, her job, to make herself ready and prepared. Well, what did she do? Let's go to verse 8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. What is fine linen? Fine linen is the righteousness, as you see in this verse. She should be arrayed in, in righteousness, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Well, what, how did she make herself ready? She was righteous. She put on righteousness, didn't she? What is the church to do? Put on righteousness. And when it talks about clean and white, this word white is the same word it's talking about when it talks about Jesus being white, when his, 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 his countenance was shining white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We also see over in Revelation 19.13, when we saw this, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Who's the armies in heaven? That's you and I. Clothed in fine linen. What's this word clothed? And duo. And what about the word in duo? Middle voice. What's that mean? The, somebody's been having, that was their responsibility. Who has the responsibility to clothe themselves? The church. And the perfect tense means they have already done it. So who's the one who's fallen on white horses? All the ones who have already clothed themselves with the fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. White and clean. Meaning pure and righteous and holy before the Lord. What does that tell you? Who's going to be up there with the Lord? The ones that have cleansed themselves, the ones that have been holy, the ones that have put on the garments of God and put off all this filthy stuff that are white and clean before the Lord. Factors of Scripture. It's over in Ecclesiastes. Even makes this statement, which, of course, is prophetic. Couldn't have been done in the Old Testament period. But Ecclesiastes 9.8, it says, Let thy garments be always white. They're always supposed to be white and clean. Don't ever let yourself have any garments that are spotted. 
Don't let anything, any spots, any blemishes be upon you. You get rid of those things. Well, we come over to Revelation chapter 3, and we see some pretty strong things that are said here. In verse 4, he says, I have a few, there's a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled or stained or contaminated their garments. Hey, that means that's pretty important. That's the church. We can't be staining our garments. They shall walk with me in white. That's the ones who put on. What's the white come from? Because of righteousness. For they are worthy. We taught on Wednesday night about how you must walk worthy before the Lord and how all the scriptures that talk about those who walk worthy before him. How, who walks worthy before him? Those that walk in white, according to righteousness. Those are the ones that have not defiled their garments. Verse 5 goes on and says, how are you going to be able to walk in white and how are you going to be able to not be defiled? You've got to conquer the enemy. You've got to conquer the attacks of the enemy. He that overcometh, the word overcometh is nakao, which means to conquer and to carry off the victory. And also, does this mean I just did it once? No. Present tense. He who was conquering and carrying off the victory continually. That's what you and I do as we do the word of God. God's given us the victory. But you and I do it as we do the word. The same, who's the one? The same or this one it literally means as Young's brings out. The one who conquers and carries off the victory continually. This one shall be clothed in white raiment, which is what? Righteousness. This is the one who's going to be found with Jesus. Same word we've seen, this Lucos, the one that's white with the Lord, who's on the armies coming back, armies in the on the white horses. So, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That tells you something. Just because your name's written in the book of life doesn't mean it's automatically going to stay there forever. It could be blotted out. But he says, I'll not blot it out. Why? Because they're clothed with white raiment. How did they get clothed with white raiment? They conquered and carried off the victory. That's why it's essential for you to conquer and carry off the victory over the enemy and not be defiled and be one who's worthy walking in white according to righteousness. It's quite a statement, isn't it? God wants us to be sure that we are walking right before the Lord. And we even see another scripture down here in Revelation 3 and verse 15. I know thy works. Your works are important. You know, to every one of those churches, one of these days, we'll do a teaching on Revelation 2 and 3, and it's a powerful message, I'll tell you. Every one of them starts out with, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. To every single one, first thing out of the, he says to them. That means your works are important. That's your deeds, what you're doing. Neither thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm, what's lukewarm? He's got a combination of cold and hot. That means he's got some hot, but he lets some cold come in. That's like the guy that's got some righteousness, but he's let some unrighteous come in, and now he's contaminated. Remember, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, doesn't it? That's why we can't have any contamination. We can't have any spots in gar on our garment whatsoever. And because you're neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee, which does mean to vomit. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. <laughs> that's not good news. He goes on, because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing in the natural. Knowest not that thou art wretched spiritually. You're absolutely wretched, he says. Now, why is a person wretched? It's because of the fact that he's walking in the ways of the flesh. This word wretched, by the way, it's only used twice. Notice it has two uses, two usages in the entire New Testament. Here's one of them, and here's the other one. And it tells you what means a person being spiritually wretched. Over in Romans, chapter 7, verse 24, this is where it's used. O wretched man that I am, Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Why was he wretched? Because he, had, he was living after this body, which is the flesh. Which means, if you're living under the body of death, living by the flesh, you're wretched, you're spiritual wretched. And what was the problem with those why they were lukewarm? They were living in the flesh, walking after the way of the flesh. The next part said about being miserable in Revelation 3, 18. And there's two, only two uses of that. We'll show you for a moment here. Revelation chapter 3, down here in verse uh, 
17, miserable, it's only used two times too. Notice there, usage, authorized version, two times. What does this mean? It's when you're spiritually miserable in God's sight. It's not why I feel miserable. It has nothing to do with that at all. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 gives us the revelation of what it means to be miserable. This is where it uses that word, second use. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're all, we are of all men most miserable. Otherwise, someone who's spiritually miserable is someone who just has hope in this life. He's living his life for, like I'm living, this is my whole life right here. No, you're not living your whole life here. This is, you're just passing through. You're a sojourner. You're a, you're a foreigner. You're a pilgrim. You're just passing through this life. This is proving ground. No, we're, we're, this is not our life. We're not, our hope is not in this life. Our hope's in the life to come. For eternity with the Lord, praise God. That shows that someone who's living a, a life just after the natural life, living basically unto themselves, that's someone who is spiritually miserable in the sight of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3, he talks about down here again. The guy's poor, spiritually poor. He's lacking the things of God. Spiritually blind, he can't see. Spiritually naked, he's not clothed spiritually. Well, we've got to be sure that we're clothed spiritually. It's, remember, that's the guy who gets spewed out, vomited out. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What's that? The word of God. And to buy means it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time and effort to study the word, to hear the word, and get it in you. That you may be rich, because the only, you're going to be rich with God's riches, spiritual riches of the word. And white raiment you're going to get, which is from the righteousness from the word of God. And that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. How's that going to happen? Through the word of God. The Word's going to open your eyes. The Holy Spirit opened the eyes. You're going to be, remember, as the Word came into you, the level of the Word brought the anointing into your life. You anoint your eyes with eye salve, so you're going to be able to see. Instead of being spiritually blind, now you're going to be able to see. He even says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's commanding anybody that's lukewarm, be zealous, repent, turn away from this. Don't let yourself stay that way any longer. He even says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. He'll come in. He's knocking at the door of our heart. He says, Let me come in. I'll get rid of all the uncleanness. I'll come in, and when God comes in, you aren't going to be lukewarm anymore. If you keep him out, you'll stay lukewarm. But if God comes in, he's going to come in, and he's going to deal with every area in your life, because the fear of God's going to come, and the holiness of God, the righteousness of God's going to come into you. And notice what else he says. It's quite a statement in verse 21. To him that conquers, same word, the guy who's been conquering and continuing to conquer, conquereth, will I grant to, I mean, the fact that he did conquer, it's aorist tense. The guy who did conquer, Young's actually missed it on this. He says who is overcoming, but that's not what the Greek says. It actually says, because of the word being, as we noticed, it's in the aorist, active, who, this is a past tense, so it should be, to him that did conquer, will I grant to sit with me in throne, my throne, even as I also conquered, same word, and this is him saying what he did, I did conquer, past tense, and am set down with my father in his throne. In other words, as Jesus did conquer, he expects you also to conquer. You mean to tell me I'm going to do the same things that Jesus did? That's right. And who's going to do it? God's going to do it through you. But how's it going to happen? You're going to put on all the garments of God through the Word so God can do everything through you. And just as those he conquered, you're going to conquer. What did Jesus do? Did he do anything of himself? Nothing. He only did as what the Father told him to do. He always obeyed. He did nothing of himself. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He had to choose to do the Word of God just like you and I and we're going to do it. Revelation 16 tells us something very important. Revelation 16, verse 15, says this, Behold, I come. The word come is in the present tense, means I am coming. I am coming. Present tense. Behold, I'm coming as or like a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. We've got to be watching. We've got to be spiritually tuned in. Continually, present tense, 
and keepeth, that means to guard and take care of your garments. Same thing, continual present tense. You are to be watching the enemy and guarding and keeping your garments lest you walk naked and they see shame. Hey, we can't be walking naked because what's the devil come to do? He comes to try to steal, kill, and destroy, doesn't he? Unless you might walk naked. It doesn't mean you're going to walk naked. It's subjunctive, meaning it's conditional upon conditions being met. You're not going to walk naked only if you allow the enemy to come in and take the word out of your heart and you turn away from righteousness and start walking in unrighteousness and they'll see his shame. Therefore, he's warning us. He's saying, blessed are those who will watch and will guard and keep their garments so lest they might walk naked, which will be the result if you don't guard and keep your garments and the enemy will come in. Well, what's going to be the result for all of us who will guard, our, 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 guard ourselves and put the garments of God on and keep them on. Look what it says in Revelation 4.4. 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders clothed in white raiment. They were clothed in white raiment. And that shows you the fact that they had been clothed and it was passive, showing the fact that this is something you're going to get once you're up there in heaven. And they had on their heads crowns of gold, golden crowns. If you and I clothe ourselves with all the things of God, when we get up there, we're going to be given something. We're going to have a clothing of white raiment and crowns of gold on us. Golden crowns. Why? Because you've done, you've, you've fought the fight. fight. You've, won, you've won the victory. A crown is a mark of someone who is it's given as the prize to the victors, notice. Notice this down here. Let's get that up there because you need to see that. Given as a prize to the victors. That means you conquered. You see, you've got to understand, this is the time for you to conquer. This is not the time for you just to skate through and live your life under yourself. No. We are going to conquer the enemies. And what are we going to do? We're going to put on the garments of God, have it put on, we enclose in ourselves with it so we will be righteous, holy, white, clean before the Lord. So what are you to clothe yourself with? It starts out with a new birth, then you get rid of all the filthy garments. Get rid of all the flesh, the sin, the demons, all these things. Put away the strange gods. Crucify the flesh. Cleanse yourself. Be holy. Put on strength. Put on your beautiful garments. Put on the garment of praise for the heaviness. Put on the salvation. Put on righteousness. Put on garments of vengeance because you're in a war and you're going to have to fight the war. Cast out the devil, see? You're going to hear and do the word. You're going to conquer all the weights and all the sins. You're going to hate the garments spotted by the flesh. No spots, no defiling in me. You're going to put on the power of God resident in you as you put on the armor of light. You're actually putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to put, on the, put off the old man, put on the new man through being renewed in the exact knowledge of God. You're going to put on mercy and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering and, and forgiveness and holding one another up and love, faith, hope, a love, all these things, humility, and you're going to be watchful and you're going to guard yourself. You're going to put off all the defilement and you're going to conquer and carry off the victory in life. And you are going to be getting a crown of gold and you're going to be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Say this, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that gives me instructions showing me what I'm to do to clothe myself with the garments of God. I will clothe myself with the garments of God and I will be holy. I will be walk white as righteous with linen garments on, <coughs> being clean, being righteous, walking before you. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. I will be clothed with the garments of God and I will be crowned with a crown of gold and I will be with you, the army of God, coming back when the enemies are destroyed. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. I will clothe myself, and I will guard myself. I put off everything that's evil, and I put on all the garments of God. Thank you for accomplishing it in my life as I do your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. 
certainly an important message, especially because we have the responsibility to do it. And we see it's a command of God. We can do it. People get overwhelmed sometimes by this and say, well, it sounds like I got so much to do. Well, you do. But who's going to do it all? God is. All you got to do is hear the word and do it. It's really that simple. Hear the word and do it. Hear the word and do it. Get your mind so renewed to the word as all you do is you think the word. Hear and do. Hear and do. Speak. Act. Anything that's foreign, you put it off. You guard yourself. You stay away from it. You don't have any of that stuff on you whatsoever. And as you get transformed and you get yourself to the place where you got the word in you, you got the garments of God on. And what's the result? You're going to carry the victory, co conquer the enemies. You're going to see the victory in every area. You're going to see these enemies put underfoot. You can cast out every devil. Yeah, it's warfare. You're going to have to get the garments of vengeance on. If you won't get it in the warfare, how are you going to get rid of all the enemies? And they're going to keep on beating you up pulling you down. That's why you've got to get rid of the weights and the sin that so easily besets you. Turn away from all that. You can walk in victory. Jesus said that he's made you more than a conqueror. He conquered, you can conquer. Just as he conquered, you can conquer. And you're going to be able to sit down in his throne with him. That was the promise of God for every one of us. And we're going to get golden crowns on our head. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth this day. We are going to be clothing ourselves with the garments of God, and we are going to conquer and carry off the victory and walk in victory, and we know you're going to accomplish it in our life through the word that we hear and do. Thank you. There'll be much fruit from this message as we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.